Welcome back. Well, yes, indeed. Those two gentlemen joins us next to, to weigh in on our next focus. Uh, Matala Sado, Director of Research and Strategy, Niger State's People's Democratic Party's Presidential Campaign Council. He joins us virtually from Kaduna. And then here with us in the studios is Sheon Faleye, who is a member of the APC and a legal practitioner. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, if, if we start off with this right away, look, it's just staring us in the face. <laughs> How could we not look at this when uh, your party, um, the ruling party, uh, you know, all that promise about 40,000 megawatts of electricity, how things need several lofty plans that they do have. But before we come to this, we've been talking about vote buying and how I like things that politicians are unhappy with moves to block vote buying. Let me even find out, you know, sound you off on this one. Are you or are there members of your party who are not happy with plans by INEC to stop vote buying by politicians? I, I, we're, we're satisfied with what INEC has put in place, the framework that INEC has put in place for, for the forthcoming election. I, we don't have any challenge with it. Um, with the APC and our candidate over time has been at the forefront of canvassing for free and fair elections. Um, over time, you recall during our time in the opposition, our challenge has always been to ensure a free and fair a democratic and electoral process. And that is coming to fruition. And that's largely based on the good leadership that the president has provided and that, you know, the free hand that he's giving to INEC to formulate this sort of um, plans. And so, so we're very happy with it. We have no complaint at all about it because we believe that the issues and solutions that we put before Nigerians is enough for them to, to make up their mind and vote their choices. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sado, um, how about you? Is your, are you or any member of your party dissatisfied with plans by the commission to stop vote buying by politicians? Well, um, thank you, Chamberlain. Um, I'm glad that I'm here this morning. Um, PDP, would not be a party that would need to buy votes in 2023 election. So the only party that would be bothered by whatever policies INEC is bringing about is the APC, the party that has failed the Nigerian people. I saw that uh, you wanted to start off with asking uh, my friends in the studio about the promise for 40,000 megawatts of electricity that was promised to Nigerian people and um, several other lofty, beautiful uh, ideas and um, manifesto that they proposed to Nigerians in 2014 in the run-up to 2015 election. So, uh, as a political party, the PDP is not going to need to um, meet any Nigeria with any Naira because uh, as it is at the moment, the people are the ones yearning for the return of the People's Democratic Party. A lot of people have said, look, APC, please take us back to where you picked us from. Return us back to where we were because Things are things were never this bad. We have never had this bad as a society. So why would the PD, PDP be even thinking or bothered by that? I think it's obvious uh, that the only political party that would have the need to look for um, voters, uh, to, to induce voters to their money, is the APC. So uh, that question is, not, as far as we are concerned in the PDP, it's not, uh, it's not necessary for us. Well, what we are focusing uh, on. Okay. is providing for Nigerian people the alternative. All right. I, I know that you may want to respond to this, but whatever response you have, you could add this to it. How do you relate to people who say, well, look, yes, there's a renewed hope manifesto, and you may have promised several things in that manifesto, but your party promised this 40,000 megawatts now, you're, you're rationing 4,000 megawatts of electricity. So whatever else that you have in the Renewed Hope Manifesto, how can we relate with this? How do we believe that if previously you promised us certain things and didn't fulfill it? I, I think it's rich coming from a representative of a party that spent billions of dollars uh, to deliver power and couldn't deliver anything. If they had spent that, that money 
judicious, judiciously, we would not be in this situation that we are. But having said that, uh, this government, this present government, you will know, has spent considerable amount of time, resources, and money to begin to deliver the sort of power um, that has generated into homes by investing considerably in our transmission and distribution capacity. And that will continue under Ashwaju. And uh, the, the key thing to note is that under the, this government, under, under this government, there's been considerable investment uh, in the power sector. And of course, um, the difference between the, the, the previous government and this government is the ability to commit those funds to actual delivery of these projects, which was lacking under the PDP. If those things have been done, we would not be where we are today. So, so what, what do we have to show for the fund now, which is it has been committed to those projects? You must understand that there is timeline between projects uh, initiation and you know undertaking of those projects and the delivery. What we're seeing at the moment is the investment in that sector to ensure that our transmission capacity is able to generate, to transmit the power that we're generating. The fact is that there is no power to to the, at least about 8,000 to 10,000 megawatts of power available. What we have seen is a lack of investment in the transmission capacity yeah, which this government has, the, has they, done. Didn't the party know all of that before they went about the promise of 40,000 megawatts? Uh, we didn't know that all of the money that they claimed they spent, the billions of dollars that they claimed they spent was never spent on those infrastructure. And uh, until those... Uh, until we got there and realized what the issues were, then we, 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 that's when we, we saw all of this. So, uh, the, 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 like I said, the key issue is that if PDP had spent those funds in a manner that they told Nigerians that it was to be spent, we would not be here. We're, we're paying for their incompetence and, and corruption, and that's, why, and that's why we're here. But Ashwaju will take this further. Ashwaju will ensure that we continue to generate more power and then provide the necessary infrastructure to, to transmit those powers to homes and businesses. I always find it very interesting when, uh, you know, things like vote buying are mentioned and then all of a sudden all of the parties become saints uh, in the business. I wonder I if mean, Anik was talking about me then. <laughs> if everybody, says, if everybody no, says, no, I don't know anything about this, it cannot, does not apply to me. Uh, Mr. Sado, I'm just a little curious. I mean, when we talk about vote buying, we have to be pretty honest and very upfront here uh, about the, the temptation that, you know, parties usually face, especially in areas perhaps where they are not too popular. And you must admit that much as we're talking about, uh, how would I put it now, the presidential elections, the elections will be conducted on different layers. There will be the presidential, the uh, the governorship elections, the National Assembly elections, etc. There is no way you can say that the PDP is not involved in vote buying at all, at whatever level. Wouldn't that be a little, uh, let's say, presumptuous on your part? You know, thank you so much, um, Marco, for <clears throat> taking away the conversation from the man that is trying to blame the People's Democratic Party after wasting seven years of Nigerians' uh, uh, time. Uh, my brother, uh, I think it's, it's important we take this conversation a, little, a notch higher. I was a supporter of, of the uh, APC, the presidential candidate of then uh, the APC, General Mohamed Bari. I was his supporter because I believed that he was coming in to change the narrative. I didn't expect that he was coming in to come out, uh, give excuses and blame the PDP. And now having said that, uh, Malkwe, as it is at the moment, the PDP is reaching out to every single citizen of this country. And as a matter of fact, the citizens are the ones that are clamoring for the PDP. The people are the ones, I, I am on ground. I am right, I've several times been at my constituency. I have related with the people. I have felt the pains of the citizens of this country. I have felt the pains that I see on the street of our country. So really, whether people uh, they engage in the traditional style of uh, trying to induce the voters or trying to solicit vote from people by using the traditional means, I really don't think that is, that is the 
the point here. The point is, what are the ideas, what are the views, and what are the plans that we have to rescue this country? What are the issues that we need to look at? And that is what I want to focus on. I want to be able to tell you, the people of, and the people of this country, that we do not have a manifesto, but we have an oppression manual, an oppression manual to be able to get Nigerian people back on, 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 on their feet, to be able to rescue the, the dying economy of this country, to be able to provide for the people of this nation and get them all working again. That is the, that is the document that Alaji Atiku Abokar has, and that is the document that I want us to focus on. How do we intend to lift people out of poverty? How do we intend to create 3 million jobs every year? These are the plans, these are the fantastic plans that we are not going to come in 2024 to give excuses, but we are coming with result. A party that promised the people a whole lot of things in 2015 and today cannot deliver it and all that they are trying to do today as at now is to blame the PDP. Should we take that party serious? Okay. Should we have in a Just a moment now, it is interesting that you say you were also a part of the PDP, well, a part of the APC at one time, and that you left because you were disappointed. It's interesting that the person whose votes, or for whom you're also canvassing votes now, was also a part of the PDP and at, at some point, and then part of the APC, and then he's back to the PDP. There was a reason the PDP lost elections in the first instance. Uh, you, some people will say that it's because it's lost the trust of the people to be able to carry on with this manifesto. Why do you think that the people deserve your trust this time around? Uh, Malcolm, thank you so much for that question. See, one thing that I thank God for Alaji Atipo Abarka's life for is the fact that he has continually look for, yearn for a better Nigeria. His desire has been that we should be able to have a Nigeria that works. That is why in 2003, he stood up, he wanted to challenge his, uh, 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 sit the, sit the president. In 2007, 2007, he ran for president. In 2011, he also wanted, because the idea that he carried in his bosom is to be able to have a Nigeria that is the Oh dear, looks the, like the, our black, guest. the country. Okay. Looks like our guest online. It's a bit uh, frozen. But let me come to you, Mr. Shea. Oh, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon <laughs> me. I, I just want to take a look at your the over overarching theme of hope. Uh, some people will find that a self indictment. Well, yes, I understand that. You know there is an attempt to paint some similarities between 1993 and what we currently have, uh, 2023, et cetera. But some people will say that, you know, the situation we were in in 1993 is or should be different from the situation in 2023. In 1993, we were under a military uh, dictatorship and that for a number of people moving into a civilian regime, uh, you know, there was reason to hope. When you use that same campaign mantra of hope, it, 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 it could be self-indicting in the sense that it means that people are, are currently in almost a state of despair and you're asking them not to give up hope. This is in a situation where your party is still controlling majority of states and is still the party at the center of power. So when you tell them to hope, are you telling them, are you acknowledging that things are pretty difficult? Are you acknowledging that things are not what you promised that it will be in 2015 when you took over? No, that, that, that's not the uh, concept behind the uh, uh, manifesto mantra. The, the fact is that as a people, as a person, you always have to hope for a better you know, future. You always have to hope for you know, uh, better uh, endeavors in the future. So really, it's not a reflection of where we are. If you look at our manifesto, uh, there are three basic issues that all of that manifesto has, you know, is seeking to achieve based on what we put before Nigeria. is to continue the job of securing Nigeria for people to go about their economic activities and you know, prosper. Is to create jobs 
by bringing in the youth for you know gainful employment, create jobs and economic opportunities for people, and most importantly, to improve the well-being of Nigerians. All of the plans from transportation to infrastructural delivery to agricultural enhancement and productivity is centered in our belief that all of those activities can enhance our, our economic opportunities and there, there, therefore provide jobs for Nigerians and enhance their you know, standard of living. I so, find it a little um, interesting. You're not talking about consolidation. I mean, someone would say consolidation I, I, 2023. It, it, You're not talking about... Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not the one to be if, providing if you, no, no, no. ideas if you, if for you. Look, if but you look the, at the, the, the thing is, I mean, that's when you talk about hope. That's essentially what it conjures. And some people will say maybe it's even apt because when you hear the fact that 133 million people are living in poverty or have, you know, are impacted with multidimensional poverty, of course, those kinds of people need. I mean, so if you the citizens I, I need to hope. but all of this mm. has happened under the watch of the APC. I'm just asking if you acknowledge if if by this theme you are acknowledging that so far you have under delivered if, if at all uh, on the promises which you gave in 2015. I, I think so far we realize that there's still a lot of work to be done as for any government, any government in power and you see it all over the world there will be constant requirements to improve the living required, living standard of people. So it's not, it's never going to be a, a finished job. It's a continuous job. And we speak to those by giving opportunities for job creation. We just speak about multidimensional poverty. And uh, we must realize that there's a major difference between monetary poverty and multidimensional poverty. And if you look at some of the activities that this government have undertaken, it's really in the plan or in the in in the in the uh, what's it called to I, I engage that multi-dimensional poverty by providing roads those are really providing access to basic infrastructure and those are the things that really speak to reducing multi-dimensional poverty in Nigeria so the the government itself that commissioned the report knows that those data are important for planning and it is in that data that you then begin to engage in planning to reduce those issues. And so it's never going to be a walk in the park. It's not an end in itself. Every government will continue to deal with the issues of security. We continue to deal with the issue of health care, the social issues that will enable the workforce to be productive. And that's right. what we will continue to do under Ashwaji Baramit. Let's bring in our colleagues from Lagos. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Let me uh, begin with uh, Mr. Sado, and I hope we have him back. Mr. Sado, are you still with us? I'm here with you, Ayo. All right, thank you. Well, uh, most of the time when we talk about issues like this, um, what I see is we're always talking about the center, the presidency, the federal government. I can't hear your question, Ayo. Okay, can you hear me better now? Okay, what, just speak out loud now, I can't, I, it's, I'm struggling to hear you. Uh, leaving out uh, the states in all of these. Okay. Mr. Mr. Sado, for me, I'd like you know to explore a bit more your candidate's position about uh, privatizing the refineries. Uh, if elected president, you know, quite a bit has been you know said about that. I, I hope you can hear me better, more clearly than you were hearing Ayo. Uh, so, um, so much has been said about you know the possibility of the possibility of handing it over to you know his cronies and all of that. But beyond that. Um, isn't it uh, tantamount to selling our national assets? I know a lot of people would say that privatization is the name of the game and, you know, refer to how Saudi's Aramco is doing pretty well. But then we also have uh, Brazil's Petrobras that is, you know, owned pretty much by a, a huge percentage by government. So doesn't it speak to, um, you know, the inability and incompetence of successive administrations to do right by, you know, the country, by Nigerians, by managing effectively uh, its national assets, 
What are your thoughts? Mr. Sado, please confirm that you can okay, hear me. I, I think we might have lost uh, Mr. Sado at that point, but we'll try and get that connection back and, and, and sort that out. But the point you were making about monetary po uh, poverty and multidimensional poverty, but I, wait a minute, okay, we'll sort that out and get back to him. So were you trying to understand that point? Were you saying that we're better monetary poverty-wise or... What exactly? No, that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that we need to dimension the difference between poverty, monetary the, the, poverty, the, the report this and, state and, and yes, and multidimensional poverty. Mm -hmm. So if you look, if you talk about our multidimensional poverty numbers, then it looks, you know, it's 130, 133. But in terms of the monetary poverty, it's much more lower than that. And it's so that people understand what the issues are and speak to the lack of assets that you know, multidimensional poverty connotes, and then see what government is doing to breach those assets deficits or those, you know, those challenges. And like I said, it's about providing assets to healthcare, providing assets, basic infrastructure like road network to allow people to get to schools, to allow people to travel much more quicker and faster. Those are multidimensional issues that add to the poverty challenges that we have. And it's important that people see what government is doing to bring you know, that, that down. But having said that, I heard what your colleague was trying to say about local politics and I mean, local government and government being really, uh, our focus on government is really at the central level. And I do believe and I agree that uh, Nigerians must pay attention to the lower level of government because that's really where the um, the impact is that's really it's the local government that deals with our sanitation issues. They deal with our primary healthcare challenges, which are which also speak to some of these multidimensional challenges that we're talking about. And we urge people to take interest in governance at that level, so that we can have you know uh, you know a, a development that is all encompassing, rather than focused at the federal level. We do have Mr. Sado back, Mr. Sado. Could you go ahead? If yes, you, you, we, we lost you at some point. So I don't know what part of the question my colleagues asked that you heard. Did you get any part of no. it? No, I think I can hear the Abuja studio very clearly, but uh, Lagos uh, studio seems to be lost at my ears. So. Well, they we're talking about uh, how we needed to focus a lot more on what's going on with the states. And as a matter of fact, in, in this uh, poverty re report that was published, uh, Sokoto, which happened to be state, uh, PDP, even though some say, look, what does it matter? But then it's a measure, isn't it, of some of the policies that your party is out there in, uh, operating and executing. So if at that level they're not able to get it right, it raises a concern for some persons that probably are at the center. Are these kind of policies too that we may see playing out? All right. Thank you so much, Amelie. I think... Uh... To respond to my colleague in the studio there, who mentioned that uh, the the monetary poverty and uh, multidimensional poverty are different. Well, I don't know what that definition is, but as a Nigerian uh, citizen, I know that um, the money in my pocket is worth less than it was worth in 2015, and uh, the things that I was I'm able to buy today um, are far far more expensive than the things I was able to buy in 2015. So, if you are talking about uh, whether the the multi-dimensional multi-dimensional poverty does not define what is happening in this government, I think he is trying to be clever. But uh, I believe that Nigerian people understand this, and Nigerian people have seen that the PD, the, the PDP is the only solution solution to the problem of the uh, that the APC has created in the country. Now, um, about um, the multidimensional poverty and um, picking on my uh, DG, uh, who is the governor of Sokoto, and uh, let, me, let me tell you something. I think, uh, like, what I wanted to focus on was to focus mostly uh, on the solutions to the problems that we are facing as a country, because I believe that that is the conversation that we need to have now, whether it be it APC, be it PDP, or be any other political party. At the moment, we should be looking for a consensus to have an agreement on the yeah. solution to Mr. the Sado, issues of this. Problem. Just a brief so, one quickly before we go. 
So these solutions that you speak about, I mean, they are within members of your party. Is it that yes. uh, Sokoto State, for instance, the party couldn't have advised them to implement some of these policies to ensure that the people's lives are a lot better because they're at the bottom of the ladder with this uh, poverty report? You see, here is what I have to say to this. Uh, and, you know, for the beginning of our conversation, I did mention that we in the People's Democratic Party and our candidate has the operational manual to fix this country. I'm, an, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've had to solve problems several, in several equipment, several machines. And all that we need to do is to have um, an operation manual to be able to uh, address whatever issues we're having with the, uh, uh, with the equipment. So all right. about, uh, well, about we, we, we need to go. Uh, we well, are out of time. But well, we did, unfortunately, I'm time sure they got your point. Then, but you, we, you say that PDP, you have the operational yeah, manual. The PDP has the operational manual to all get right. Nigeria working. All right. Well, I have to thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah, to, to be honest, the, the, just if I may add, the operational manual that PDP has is selling Nigerian assets to their private cronies. Their, right. their principal has done it before. It's lots, all of those companies are nowhere to be found. Well, there are two different things, privatization? Yes. And you, when you say selling, yes, it's it's privatization. something it's, different. It's, 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 that's what he did. All right. Uh, we we'll thank both of you for coming on. Uh, Sean Fale and Mataya Sado, members of APC and PDP, talking about what their several various principles would do. They all say they have the magic bullet. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Well,